I can't think of anybody in the peace and justice movement who walks their talk in a more important, significant way than Medea does. And she, she, and I also, I love the fact that she's always there at congressional hearings and when somebody's giving an important talk, even President Obama, she has the brazenness to interrupt them and to sort of speak to the other side of the issue. And I, she has now modeled that as a, as a way for all progressives to sort of interrupt talks when their side is not being represented. Medea has won so many peace awards that it's really hard to remember them all. I did see that in 2014, she got the Gandhi Award and we're really, you know, in this time of despair, we need somebody who is really relentless in the pursuit of peace and justice. And Medea is one of those people. So I think you'll be inspired by her. She's going to talk about her new book on Iran. And I hope you will buy a copy, buy several copies for friends and family. So let's welcome Medea Benjamin now. So I was going to, uh, when we first, uh, I was first invited here, it was to talk about my uh, new book on Iran. Uh, but since then, many other things have happened. <laughs> and uh, one of the big things has been the murder of this Saudi journalist, Jamal Khashoggi. And I see some of you nodding your heads that you've been following this. So I wanted to start out first talking about this because we don't know where this is going, um, but it has opened up a lot of issues. The U.S. has been putting its lot in in the Middle East with Israel and Saudi Arabia for decades now. And the, uh, both Israel and Saudi Arabia depend on the United States hegemony. And in turn, the United States protects Israel and Saudi Arabia. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, this has been a transactional arrangement where at one point it was a lot about oil and it still is even though we don't import all that much Saudi oil. Uh, Saudis can control the prices because they have so much oil. Uh, it also became an issue about Saudi using those petrodollars to invest in the United States. And they did that in a very brilliant way because they became embedded in our economy. And so that's one of the issues now that Trump is facing. Uh, and another, as part of the investments in our economy, a big part of that is weapons. And it's just so disgusting that we have built this economic system where you have somebody like Trump who is at least overt about it and says right out there, we can't uh, cut off um, relations with Saudi and the weapon sales because it's so many jobs and so much money. And of course, he keeps exaggerating. Every time he says it, it's another amount of money. You know, first it was, uh, well, uh, when Obama went, and it's important to, to state that Obama sold a lot of weapons to Saudi Arabia, but he wasn't as crass about it. Um, because Trump went and said, I'm going to sell even more weapons than Obama did. And so he talks about $110 billion, most of which was negotiated under the Obama administration, and most of which is over a long period of time, like 10 years. So really you're talking about $10 billion at most. Um, and, uh, but then in talking about the number of jobs, at one point Trump said it was 40,000 jobs and then it was 100,000 jobs and he just keeps you know, inflating the number of jobs. No matter how much money and how many jobs, just think of the reflection on us as a people that the sale of weapons is more important than human life. And so this has become out in the open with the death of one person and that is uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Now the reason that this has become so important is because uh, he was a journalist, and not just any journalist. He was a journalist for a major US paper, the Washington Post, and the Washington Post is pissed, and so are most of the US media. And I live in Washington, DC, so I read the Washington Post every day, and Every day there are articles about it. Every day there are editorials about it. And this has been going on for three weeks now. And um, also, the reason that this is uh, such an important issue 
is because it was done outside of Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia does horrible things to its people all the time, but we don't know about it because it's inside Saudi Arabia. But this, they had the nerve to do in the consulate of an allied country of NATO, a uh, NATO country, Turkey. And so for a number of reasons, it has become a major international issue. And uh, so when you have something of this scale, um, you really don't know if it's going to blow over or if it's going to really have an impact. One of the issues is, is the US going to continue to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia? Now, if we had a media that was telling us um, the truth about US policy overseas, um, we would have had people demanding a long time ago that US cut off weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, not because of one journalist, but because of the daily horrendous deaths by starvation of the children of Yemen. And I don't know if any of you got to see the New York Times article that came out two days ago, but you know, it is heartbreaking when you see it with the photos. Um, because the photos are of starving children. And you know, they're always saying on the brink of starvation. They're not on the brink of starvation, they are starving. I used to be a nutritionist in an earlier life. And I worked for the United Nations and my job was to travel around the world um, in places where children were starving to death. And after I had about 20 children die in my arms from starvation, I couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, I'm going to stop being a nutritionist. I'm going to do the political work because this is about politics. And in Yemen, you see it so absolutely clearly. It is a human made disaster made by the Saudis because they want to use famine as a weapon of war. And so the US throwing its lot in with the Saudis is not only supplying the weapons, refueling the planes in the air. And you know what it means to refuel the planes in the air? It means that those planes have to, don't have to come down to get more bombs so that they can just keep bombing and more people will keep dying. And it's not just the people who are killed by the bombs, it's that the, that the bombs are destroying the infrastructure. And studies that were done showed that a third of the destruction was of civilian targets. And we were helping them in the targeting. They were choosing to bomb the water supply. They were choosing to bomb the marketplaces. They were choosing to bomb the hospitals and the clinics because this was part of the strategy and it is part of the strategy. So the US was not only providing the weapons and the logistical support, it was also giving the diplomatic cover. And uh, when the issue would come up at the United Nations, the US would quash any discussion of it. And the Saudis with the US ha help have been committing war crimes in Yemen. There are very few people in our Congress who have been speaking out against it, but some have. Bernie Sanders has, Senator from Connecticut, Chris Murphy has, a Republican conservative Senator, Mike Lee has, and they have put forward a resolution to cut off US support for the war in Yemen. And there has been a similar uh, resolution on the House side. But these have not passed. Incredibly, they have not passed because Congress has a lot more access to inside information than we have. And certainly they must know that this is a war that is killing civilians constantly, daily. Certainly they know that this is a war that has led to the greatest outbreak of cholera in modern history of over a million people affected by it. Certainly they must read the reports from the United Nations who say this is the greatest human catastrophe in the world. And those reports were just revised to say that entire half of the population is either starving or facing starvation. And, and so the fact that 
the U.S. government and our elected representatives know this and haven't cut off the weapons supply or the U.S. support is really disgusting. It's heartbreaking. And you know this is part of this in military industrial complex where they get money from the weapons companies and the weapons companies want to continue to sell more weapons and it's why we're in the state of perpetual war. But the Saudi example is just such a raw example of everything that's wrong with our system. Because supporting this regime has always been problematic. Sure, it's gotten worse since this young Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, came into power three years ago. But it was always a country that was based on a perversion of Islam. It was always a country that was spreading extremism around the world. It provided 15 of the 19 hijackers here uh, at the 9-11 attack. It was always a country that repressed its own people the minority, Shia, in, in, absolutely um, illegal to openly practice any other religion like Christianity or Judaism. Always a country that treated women as second class or third class citizens. But Mohammed bin Salman, when he came in, he made things worse. And he was the one who got the Saudis involved in the war in Yemen. And he is the one who was in charge of a new crackdown on human rights activists. He is the one that had the nerve to bring in the um, head of the prime minister of Lebanon and actually kidnap him and force him to publicly state that he was resigning from his position until he left and then he went back on everything. Um, and that was because Lebanese had been working uh, with Hezbollah, which is considered a legitimate political party and is close to Iran. He was the one who created a crisis in the Gulf states by declaring a blockade of Qatar because Qatar was too close to Iran. He was the one that took over 200 of the wealthiest people in the nation, royalty, business people, kept them in prison in a five-star hotel. I'll give them that. It was in a five-star hotel, the Ritz-Carlton. But beatings and torture until they agreed to give up a lot of their money. In fact, it's estimated that he got over $100 billion from the shakedown of these people. And this was portrayed as his campaign against corruption. There was absolutely no due process in any of this. And this money is now in his control. And by the way, as part of his uh, supposed crackdown on corruption, he then went ahead and bought the most expensive yacht in the world for $550 million, bought the most expensive painting in the world for $450 million, and then bought a French chateau for $300 million. This is part of the anti-corruption uh, campaign. So why is it then that this crown prince was portrayed in the U U.S. as a reformer? Do you remember when he came to the United States? Some of you did. This was in March. And as he traveled around, he was three weeks in the United States. And I know that, that Code Pink, along with some of the other peace groups, but very few of us, followed him around where he went when we could figure out where he was going because we knew it was absolutely ridiculous to call this guy a reformer. Do you remember why he was called a reformer? He was going to allow women to drive. But what wasn't told in the media, that before he, quote, allowed women to drive, he picked up the very women who had fought for the right to drive and threw them in prison. The other things that he was a reformist about? Remember anything else? Movies, that's right. He had lifted the ban on movies, which is a great thing. I mean, you know, people should be allowed to go to movies. But what a low bar, right? Uh, <laughs> they could go to the movies. And um, this was also part of new deals that he was uh, doing with Hollywood. 
hundreds of billions of dollars of deals with Hollywood. They were going to build a Disneyland in Saudi Arabia that was twice the size of Disneyland. And uh, Hollywood was very excited about getting Saudi money. In fact, part of the itinerary of the Crown Prince was to first be feted in DC by both the Democrats and Republicans. And I remember standing out in front of the, um, the Mellon Center where they were having this gala. And we would just run after every single congressperson, every single senator saying, why are you going inside there? This guy is a killer. This guy is a war criminal. And they would say, no, he's a reformer. He's allowing women to drive and he's opening movie theaters. <laughs> well, um, one of the reasons why there was just this um, uh, whitewashing is because there are about 24 different companies in Washington and New York, PR firms, that are registered agents of the Saudi government. And their job is to paint Saudi Arabia as this reformist country moving into the modern world, uh, a great partner and a really critical ally of the United States. And so they have been working overtime to paint Mohammed bin Salman in this light. And then all of a sudden comes the death of Jamal Khashoggi and everything is turned upside down. So it is amazing to see, for example, after, and, and for those of you who haven't followed this closely, we still don't know all the details, but we do know that this man with his fiance waiting outside goes into the consulate in Istanbul to get his papers, never comes out. First, the Saudi said, oh yes, he came out. <laughs> he went out the back door, but the footage has disappeared. Then they said, uh, it was a mistake. There was a brawl between this like 60 year old Jamal Khashoggi, very uh, uh, soft spoken gentleman, uh, was in a brawl with um, 15 members of the security from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, right. Uh, and now it's that it was premeditated uh, murder, but it wasn't done by anybody high up in the Saudi government, as if you could pull anything off like this without the highest okay in the, in the Saudi government. So um, there was a, a, uh, a, few, uh, a big uh, economic gathering that, was, that just happened, October 23rd to 25th. It's, it's dubbed Davos in the desert, um, but it is an economic forum where last year was the first year it happened, and this year was supposed to be even bigger and better than the year before, where uh, business people from all over the world come to wheel and deal. And we're not talking about wheeling and dealing, and usually it's not millions of dollars. We're talking about billions of dollars, a massive amounts of money. And so because of the Khashoggi issue, there was a big campaign to get all these companies to not go to Saudi Arabia, and dozens of them did pull out. And in fact, if you saw any of the TV footage of that meeting, you could tell that they just filled the whole place with local people so that it would be full. Um, but that doesn't mean that these businesses are going to stop doing business with Saudi Arabia. There's too much money involved. And so our job now is to name and shame all of these businesses, whether it's PR firms, whether it's companies, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's the elite universities in the United States that have entire wings named after Saudi royalty, um, or whether it's the think tanks that have been getting money. And I tell you, I, um, when Pat introduced me as somebody who gets up and does some interrupting, there is so much interrupting that needs to be done <laughs> just on this issue of Saudi Arabia. I mean, the other day there was an Arab cultural evening. And, you know, you hate to interrupt an Arab cultural meeting because, it's, you know, we love culture and don't want to look like you're against Arab culture. But it was sponsored by Saudi Arabia. And so, you know, we had to do it. So we came up before the thing started and got up and, you know, uh, stood up there with pictures of Jamal Khashoggi and, and Yemeni children and said, um, you know, we, you might not know this, but this whole thing is being sponsored by the Saudi government. And um, we heard a groan from the entire audience because people didn't really know that. 
And now what has shifted is that before the, the death of Kamal uh, Khashoggi, if we said that, we would have gotten booed by a lot of people in the audience. It is totally shifted right now. And that is enormous. So whether or not we are able to cut off weapons sales, the US support for the war in Yemen, whether or not this is going to lead to the crown prince being replaced by another one, the, the uh, public opinion of Saudi Arabia has changed. And that will lead to change in policy. And so that leads me to talk now about Iran. Because really, so much of the energy of Saudi Arabia has been to get the US involved in, in a campaign to either isolate Iran or overthrow Iran. Because there is this hatred between Saudi Arabia and Iran that really came forward after the Iranian Islamic Revolution in 1979. And it's interesting that until uh, this day, the US talks about Iran as being the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the Middle East. And for a long time, there were only a few voices of us that said, no, it is Saudi Arabia that is the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the Middle East. And now you have a lot of people who are saying that which opens up the issue of why do we hate Iran so much? And so there we have to really look at the history, and that's why I wrote the book on Iran. Um, one of the um, sad jokes about Americans is that war is the a way that we learn geography. And unfortunately, there's a, a lot of truth to that. But I think it's so important that we learn about Iran as a way to prevent the United States from going to war. And at a time in our history when we have focused so much on the Russian interference in our elections, it would be very good to have a history lesson about US interference in other people's elections and other people's political systems. And Iran would be the one to put right up there. Because you have to, un to understand uh, today, you have to look back at 1953 and understand that back in the earlier 1940s, 1950s, the Iranian people realized that their oil supply was being used to benefit a, a, a British company, which is now BP, instead of being used for the benefit of the Iranian people. And so what did they do? they voted in a prime minister with a mandate to nationalize their oil. And when Mohammad Mossadegh won in 1951, he started in the next few years to implement that mandate of nationalizing the oil. And in 1953, when they were about to do it, the British panicked, went to the United States, convinced the US and the CIA that they had to do something about it because not only was this terrible for the Iranian oil supply, but what a bad example this would be for other countries that had resources that we in the West wanted. And so the CIA went in there and did a coup and overthrew the democratically elected government of Mohammed Mossadegh in 1953. And at that time, it was considered a, quote, successful coup. And indeed, it was successful. And it was so successful that the US, the CIA used that same model of covert intervention uh, the following year in Guatemala when they overthrew the government of Jacobo Arbenz, used it in 1960 in the Congo to overthrow the government of Patrice Lumumba, tried to use it in 1961 to overthrow Castro in Cuba. Um, but we have to look back at what does it mean to have a successful coup? Because in the case of Iran, the Shah was brought back in. The Shah, with a very repressive regime, became even more repressive and destroyed any civil society that existed, any group that was going to dissent against the government or against the reprivatization of the oil, and also became the number one uh, purchaser of US weapons back in that time and use those US weapons to repress their own people. And 
where was the only space available for people to organize against this repressive regime? The only space were the mosques. And that's how the clerics became so powerful. And when they were finally successful in overthrowing the Shah in 1979, it wasn't the secular groups who had tried very hard to overthrow the Shah. Iran had a history of leftist organizing. They had a very strong socialist party, but they weren't strong enough to come to power. The ones who really had the strength and the organizational capacity were the clerics. And that's why it became an Islamic revolution and a conservative Islamic revolution. And it was at that time after the revolution because it was not only anti-Shah, it was anti-American. And rightly so, it was anti-American. But it meant that the US cut off and Iran cut off diplomatic relations. Those relations have never been restored in all of these years. And the US imposed sanctions one type of sanction or another over all of these years. And um, so if you want to fast forward to the time of the Obama administration, that was really a moment to open up a new story between the US and Iran by negotiating an Iran nuclear deal. It was an extremely important moment not just to make sure that Iran didn't get nuclear weapons, but to use it as John Kerry, who was the Secretary of State and negotiated that agreement, said, as a springboard to talk to Iran about other issues, Iran's involvement in other areas in the region, interballistic missiles, all of those kinds of things. So um, the uh, Iran nuclear deal was not just an agreement between the US and Iran. It was an agreement that was negotiated with the French, the Germans, the British, uh, for, uh, the uh, Chinese, and the Russians. It was unanimously approved by the entire European Union and unanimously approved by the UN Security Council. So it had tremendous international support, but it had one fatal flaw. And that was not the flaw that Obama and uh, that Trump and other people have been talking about, that it had a sunset clause, that it didn't include these other issues. The fatal flaw is that it was not a formal treaty. It was an executive agreement. And it wasn't a formal treaty because Obama knew he didn't have the two thirds in the Senate he needed to ratify that treaty. And so that made it possible when Trump came in and he had indeed campaigned saying that this was the worst deal ever, he was gonna get rid of it, but it made it possible for him to pull the US out of that treaty. And it's important to recognize who was Trump listening to. I just said it was the entire European Union, the entire UN Security Council that had approved the agreement also, it was the Atomic Energy Agency that is entrusted to monitoring the agreement said in 11 different occasions that Iran was indeed complying with the agreement. But instead, Trump listened to Israel because Netanyahu was always against this agreement, just like the Saudis were always against the agreement. But you right, might remember that Netanyahu came to the United States and addressed a joint session of Congress and had the nerve to be talking about the threat of Iran's nuclear weapons and how you couldn't trust Iran when Iran, how many nuclear weapons does Iran have? Zero, let's be clear, zero. How many nuclear weapons does Israel have? Some said 200, some said 400, some said to uh, 60, we don't know is the right answer. We don't know because the Israelis have always kept it a secret. They've always lied about their own nuclear program. And um, so here you have Netanyahu that would never join the non-proliferation treaty, would never allow any inspectors into Israel saying that the US should pull out of this Iran nuclear deal. And I don't know about you, I don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, but I don't want Israel to have nuclear weapons either. 
I don't want anybody to have nuclear weapons. But the hypocrisy of the U.S. with our thousands of nuclear weapons and putting a trillion dollars into modernizing them, and in Israel with its nuclear weapons that it refuses to even acknowledge, telling Iran that this deal wasn't good enough when it was the deal that had the most intrusive inspections of any deal ever negotiated, um, is, I think, the, the height of chutzpah. So you have Trump listening to... Um, Netanyahu, and of course it's part of Trump wanting to undo anything of significance that Obama had done, like the uh, health care, like the Paris Climate Accords, like the diplomatic um, uh, relations that had improved with Cuba, and then of course this issue about Iran. And so one other thing that Trump does is bring into his inner circle somebody who is absolutely known as a person who has wanted to bomb Iran. And who is that? John Bolton. John Bolton wrote several years ago in a New York Times uh, op-ed um, to stop Iran's bombs, bomb Iran. And he has um, now, as head of the, the National Security Advisor, the one who has Trump's ear on this. He is also very close to a group that is considered by the majority of Iranians to be a terrorist organization. It's known by its initials, the MEK. Now, the MEK uh, was a group that had been fighting against the Shah, but it lost control when the Islamists took over. And many of those people were killed by the new government. They had reason to hate the new government. But what they did is, when there was a war starting a year after the Islamic Revolution in 1980 that went on for eight bloody years against Iraq because Saddam Hussein invaded Iran, this group went over to the enemy side, went over to Iraq. They were trained and armed by Saddam Hussein to go back into their own country, Iran, and blow things up, which they did. And they killed a lot of civilians. And so they will never be forgiven for that. They're also seen as a cult organization. Even the US intelligence sees them as a cult organization. But this is an organization that John Bolton loves, that he has spoken at their rallies and uh, reported to have received about $180,000 for his speaking fees, and that has told them, we will see you and be together in Tehran very soon. Um, people inside Iran, many of them do not like their own government. Sound familiar? Uh, <laughs> and would like to see their government overthrown. They do not want to see the MEK. They say the MEK, it's a joke to think that the MEK could be in charge. So what is the US doing? It's putting up groups like the MEK as a possible vi viable alternative which sounds ridiculous to most Iranians. But the other thing it's doing is tightening and tightening and squeezing the sanctions. So I said one form or another of sanctions have been in place for all these years. But now we're talking about sanctions at a whole different level. So when the US withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal, it's called snapbacking sanctions. It put sanctions back in place. And it says to the rest of the world, not only are our countries not able to deal with Iran, not our, our companies, but your companies, wherever you are, if you deal with Iran, you cannot have economic uh, uh, deals with, uh, in the United States. We will impose sanctions on you. And this is no joke. Most companies understand that they have to make a choice. Are they going to work in the United States where there is you know, trillions of dollars of trade? Or are they going to work in Iran, which has a much, much, much smaller economy? So the Europeans want to keep the Iran deal in place. They have not pulled out. Neither have the Russians nor uh, the Chinese. But Iran says we have to have some benefit, some economic benefit, because we are being squeezed so hard. 
A new round of sanction is going to be put in place on November 4th. It probably won't receive a lot of attention here because we're in the midst of elections and shootings in synagogues and um, uh, bombs and, and all kinds of other things. But it's going to be a huge issue in Iran because already the economy is just uh, uh, in a free, uh, free spin downwards. And um, the value of the currency has lost by about 70% in the last six months. Prices have doubled and tripled. The companies that were negotiating deals with Iran after the signing of the Iran nuclear deal, um, even though their governments say, stay in there, the, the, uh, the, the European companies like Total, the gas company, the, the petroleum companies, um, the car companies like Peugeot, um, the uh, uh, Airbus that was going to sell billions of dollars worth of commercial airlines to Iran, which really needs them because they're uh, using very old, dangerous uh, civilian planes. These deals have all fallen through because the companies say, we don't want to face US sanctions. And so um, on November 5th, the new set of sanctions will be even worse because that is supposed to cut off energy, the ability of Iran to sell its uh, oil overseas and gas. There are countries that are saying, we want to keep buying them. But we see Mike Pompeo and other people in this administration going around the world, strong arming even big co countries like India or South Korea or Japan and say, don't you dare buy Iranian oil. So we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Iran thinks it can keep selling its oil, and, and especially there's one country uh, that uh, it hopes will continue buying, and that is China. But even China is feeling the pressure. And again, do they want to incur the wrath of the United States? So the US has so much economic power right now that it is, it is squeezing Iran so hard. The goal is that the Iranian people will then rise up. And they will rise up, and what will happen? And that's what the Iranians don't see. If they come out and they overthrow their government, they said, who will come? What government will come and replace it? They look around the region, and they look ter at the region terrified. They see what's happening in Syria. They see what happened when the US and the NATO allies overthrew Gaddafi in Libya. Absolute disaster where there's human trafficking now uh, on a scale unprecedented, um, where there are the, the migrant crisis, the, the thousands and thousands of people leaving through Libya has caused the, the crisis in, in Europe. They look and they see what's happening in Yemen. And they say, we don't want to be like those other countries. Things are bad now, but they could even be worse. And so what a lot of people are thinking is that what the US wants is just chaos inside Iran that the goal is chaos, because that will be a weak country and a divided country. And there are indeed a lot of different ethnic minorities in Iran, and the US has been shoring up those ethnic minorities, encouraging them to, to rise up. Um, and, um, and people in Iran that I talk to think Israel really wants to see Iran weak and divided and fighting among themselves. And so people are really discouraged and terrified inside Iran. Well, I think their situation is a lot more dire because um, their economic situation has taken a very, very large middle class and plunged, the, plunged them into poverty. But we also should recognize that Iran has a large military. And there are people in the US military who understand how disastrous it could be if the US got involved in a military confrontation with Iran. And many people inside the US uh, military don't want to go there, but feel they might be goaded into it. Right now, there are proxy wars that are happening in the region where the US could be pulled in. Uh, US has warships in the Persian Gulf, and there are Iranian ships 
that are trailing these warships. And just yesterday, there was a piece in the paper where Iran said that US helicopters were uh, following their ships, and they felt they had the right to shoot down US helicopters if they came too close. Mm -hmm. So there could easily be some kind of confrontation. And Iran has not only a very large military, it also has base, it also knows that the US has bases all around the region and could make life very difficult for US military in those bases. It has allies with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. It has allies of Shia militia in Iraq that could make life miserable for a lot of US troops that are still uh, stationed in the region. And it also has implied that it could uh, cut the Strait of Hormuz, where so much of the world's oil that is uh, sh shipped it goes through, uh, which could cause an economic catastrophe for the entire globe. So those might be sort of the modifying uh, factors in this. But things are very, very dire. And when we see what happens November 5th, if indeed the US is capable of cutting off Iran's ability to sell its oil, um, then things are going to heat up very, very, very fast. Um, what is happening in Congress? You don't have a lot of sympathy for Iran in Congress because Congress is very careful uh, to be pro-Israel, even if they're not so pro-Saudi anymore. Uh, and um, but there is a concern about U.S. getting into a military confrontation with, with Iran. And so there, uh, are, there, there is one piece of legislation that would remind uh, Donald Trump that the Constitution actually says that it's Congress's responsibility to declare war and not the executive branch, and that uh, Trump could not take military action against Iran without first going to Congress. Uh, unfortunately, the executive branch has been doing its own waging of war for a long time now, and I don't think that would stop Donald Trump. Um, but we do have to find ways that we educate people more about the threat of war with Iran, and we do more to try to stop a, a, a war. Um, we at Code Pink are organizing an Iran summit December 1st. If any of you are interested in joining us in Washington, D.C., a day-long, very in-depth look at U.S.-Iranian relations and what can we do. We're also taking a large peace delegation to Iran. We just got the okay from the Iranian government because they're very worried about Americans going there. Uh, and it will be in the second week of January. If any of you are interested in going, um, please uh, go to the Code Pink website and you can look at the trip. It's a very uh, inexpensive trip for going uh, all the way to Iran and all the things we'll be doing while we're there. But we think it's important to get more Americans there to come back and talk about what they have seen. So before I end, I want to just move into a broader uh, perspective, which is to um, look at the issue of um, the, how do we address the weapon sales um, that we know is fueling so much of our policy. And that, uh, I, what I wanted to mention is a new campaign um, that Code Pink, along with Peace Action, uh, Veterans for Peace, World Beyond War, a number of other groups has launched, which is to follow in the footsteps of the people who have done such a good job in the environmental community of pulling literally trillions of dollars out of the fossil fuel industry through a divest from fossil fuels campaign. You might also know there's a divest campaign, a divesting from Israel. There's a divest campaign to divest from the prison industry. Um, and we have now a divest campaign to divest from the weapons industry. It's way long overdue, and it's very exciting uh, to have a tool that we have created called a weapons-free fund, where you can look up literally thousands of investment companies and see if indeed they have investments in weapons companies. And this is a tool that the students from Parkland can use because it's also about like assault rifles as well as people who want to look at foreign policy issues. And it's a tool that we can use when we go to our city councils and say, we want our city to be divested from war. We want our universities to be divested from war. We want our pension funds divested from war. And of course, there's also our um, elected officials. 
And I'm, I, I think you all know how our elected officials take so much money from the weapons industry and the big lobby that they have. And then they turn around and they vote every year for this massive, massive budget for the Pentagon, half of which then goes back to these weapons companies. So um, we've been going to our members of Congress and saying, this is a terrible conflict of interest. We need you to commit that you won't take money from the weapons industry, and, uh, as well as from the NRA. And we've been having success with a couple of dozen of them, and we need to push this more uh, as we have a new Congress that comes in in November. So I don't know if any of you are working in this divestment campaign, but it does give something to do for people who are really concerned about the state of perpetual war that we're in and want to know how they can get involved on a very local level um, because these campaigns in and of themselves are so educational for people to learn how much the weapons industry has seeped into every fabric of our economy, both at the local and the state and the national level. So um, let me end here and just say thank you for those of you who have been doing this work for so long. Um, we work very closely with Peace Action at the national level, uh, as well as in different states, and it's um, so important that there are people who really have their main focus of their activism uh, on these issues of war. Um, you know how difficult it is to build a mass movement uh, on the war issues because there are so many other issues um, that are more direct to people, that they see more clearly. Uh, and, um, but I think as we move forward with moments like this, when we have a chance to uh, see and read in our newspapers, I mean, there was a wonderful editorial in the Post today um, saying what I never thought I'd hear in Post saying, uh, that um, human lives should be more important than the sale of weapons. Um, so we do have a moment now where other people are talking about the same issues that we've been talking about for many years. So let's move this, use this moment to uh, broaden our movement and uh, do whatever we can so that uh, we do have a foreign policy in the years to come where nobody would ever dare say what Donald Trump said, uh, that we cannot change our relationship with a despicable country like Saudi Arabia because they buy so many of our weapons. Uh, that cannot be the basis of um, U.S. foreign policy. The basis of U.S. foreign policy has to be one that we do not sell weapons to countries that, that murder journalists or commit war crimes. We do not sell weapons to countries that occupy other people's territory, as in Palestine. Um, we do not support repressive regimes, uh, and we won't allow our own um, weapons companies to uh, dictate what our, our government does. Um, and as we um, move forward, I just want to finally mention the issue of the caravan in, um, in Mexico right now, uh, because I don't know how many people in this country really understand how much our foreign policy has to do what is happening there, and maybe we'll have some time we could discuss that. Uh, but these issues of U.S. interventions, U.S. support for coups, uh, like the coup regime in Honduras, um, has consequences has terrible consequences for the people in those countries, and eventually has consequences for us here at home. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs>